coming to our third in this uh, year's session of Power Talks, organized in collaboration uh, with the Toronto International Art Fair. We've had two um, really fascinating presentations so far by Douglas Fogel, um, who spoke about the Carnegie International, and by Fumio Nanjo, who spoke about his work as a curator um, in Japan and also for the Singapore Biennale. So we've had some wonderful international perspectives, and I know that today's speaker will um, probably exceed our expectations. So it's a great pleasure to introduce Ivana Glaswick. Um, as a curator, writer, and museum director, Ivana is a dynamic force within the British art world. She's the director of London's Whitechapel Art Gallery, and is in the process of spearheading their $26,000 million restoration of a former library building which adjoins the gallery and that will become a major new arts resource for the city and it's due to open next year. Um, before this, uh, Ivana was head of exhibitions and displays at Tate Modern and she was involved in, uh, she played a very key role, probably possibly the strongest role in defining um, that world's, um, sorry, in defining one of the world's most popular art museums and she was uh, integrally involved in um, thinking through how to uh, present their uh, displays with uh, that sort of new conceptual approach to museum displays. Um, Ivana actually had trained as an artist and um, I read somewhere that she didn't want to be a second-rate artist so she um, gave it up in favour of curating so um, maybe we lost a really brilliant artist, we certainly gained a really brilliant curator and I think you can see her background as an artist in everything that she does. She takes an extremely innovative approach to everything that she does and she has an incredible eye as you will see just from some of the artists that she's worked with. Um, but she takes this creative approach to everything she spearheads from her exhibitions to um, publishing projects. She's responsible for setting up the contemporary art program at Fine Press and has recently initiated a new publishing program with the Whitechapel Art Gallery and MIT Press. Um, I can't remember what the, the books are called now, but there's one on participation that we have at the Power Plant, mm -hmm. there's one on the artist's joke, it's a terrific new series. Um, she also takes a very creative approach to, to teaching. She's um, been on the faculty of numerous institutions, but I think most sort of pivotally um, was one of the first tutors on the Royal College uh, Curatorial Studies Programme in London. She also takes a, a very um, fresh approach to uh, her new um, responsibilities as, as a director and a fundraiser. I just heard about a tour that she gave for some of their donors um, in which she rented a private jet and gave them a bird's eye view of land art throughout the US, which, you know, uh, wow. <laughs> so, um, we're really thrilled that Ivana could join us for this weekend, and it's been really fun taking her around Toronto. We went to a number of galleries yesterday, and of course to Nuit Blanche, and um, her insights into what we've been looking at are invariably spot on. And um, you know, she, she made the nice comment yesterday that ter uh, Canada has um, really more than its fair share of really excellent contemporary artists, which of course we agree with, but it's nice to hear from someone like her. So, um, thanks again, Ivana. Um, welcome. Thank you very much. Um, undeserved praise, and I hope I can live up to it. Um, okay, museums. Should we just burn it down? <laughs> Artists certainly have thought so, and they've been telling us to do that for a very long time. Certainly in 1909, Filippo Marinet uh, Emilio Marinetti, one of the futurists, called for their wholesale destruction. And he summed them up as cemeteries. Absurd abattoirs of painters and sculptors ferociously slaughtering each other. Cemeteries of empty exertion. Calvaries of crucified dreams. Registries of aborted beginnings. From the very get-go, artists have sought to destroy institutions, to critique them, to pull them apart, um, and to make us all aware of the kind of power plays that are implicit within them. 
um, not only in institutions, but also in the whole process of curating, acquiring works of art, and exhibiting them. In 1981, the American artist Mary Kelly commented, the exhibition system marks a crucial intersection of discourses, practices, and sites, which define the institutions of art within a definitive social formation. Moreover, it is exactly here, within this intertextual, interdiscursive network, that the work of art is produced as text. Taking this kind of, um, these two positions as a starting point, um, I wanted us to consider the institution today because they haven't gone away, they haven't been burnt down, they just get bigger and there's more of them. Um, and so we have to think about why. Why are they important? Why do they play such a key role in the cultural landscape? So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the um, institution as avatar. Now, how do I get that to be a full screen? Excuse me. I'm a technophobe. <laughs> I'll carry on. Kelly's analysis acts as a benchmark within a discourse which has evolved over the last century <laughs> and which has dissected the notion of the exhibition space. Crucially, it is artists who have interrogated the conventions of exhibition making and the transition of the gallery environment from academy to salon, from white pew to site, from space to situation. The exhibition space, be it museum or laboratory, can no longer be understood as neutral, natural or universal, but rather as thoroughly prescribed by the psychodynamics of politics, economics, geography and subjectivity. I'm going to use my own institution as a kind of case study. Uh, because we're in transition, we're a hundred year old public art gallery, we're a Kunsthalle, we have no collection, and we're about to double in size along with everybody else. So, um, in terms of um, joining this kind of uh, model of growth, I thought it was an interesting time to step back and analyse what we could do, how we could do it, and what lessons to be learned from the past. We were founded in 1901, not by a great patron, but actually by a priest, um, called Canon Barnett, who wanted to bring great art to the people of the East End of London. It's one of the poorest areas in Europe, um, and it's been traditionally the place also which is the most cosmopolitan, because it's very poor, it's always welcomed immigrants. Um, most notably in the late 19th century, there was a very nasty anti-Semitic pogrom in Eastern Europe, and people came from Russia, <coughs> Germany, Austria, Poland, and they came to the East End of London. Um, and Interestingly enough, they brought them their books, highly literate, highly educated exodus, who brought knowledge, uh, historical past, and in the building next door to the Whitechapel Gallery was the biggest collection of Yiddish publications in Europe in the early 1900s. That demographic has changed. Uh, in the 1940s and 50s, it's, it's, it uh, moved towards a South Asian demographic. Um, and one of our problems is that as people prosper, they leave. So their prosperity isn't really ploughed back into the area. However, because it's a very poor part of the city, it's also where artists naturally gravitate. There are 10,000 artists who live in a square mile around Whitechapel and 120 galleries. So it's a very interesting place to work. Very cosmopolitan, very diverse, very dynamic. Now, the... Um, the, the, the challenge in this situation was to... Um, in, the early 19, in the late 19th century, the, uh, there was a kind of Victorian impulse to improve the world, to act as a kind of missionary into the darkest reaches of what were known then as the drunken classes. Um, and uh, there's a historian called Seth Govan who said that the mission of, of Canon Barnett and his wife Henrietta Barnett was to use the display of art objects and to create a working class public in order to promote social reclamation and urban renewal. Well, that continues in a way to this day. If you think about how the agendas around museums are very much locked into urban regeneration. The gallery and exhibitions were conceived in instrumentalist terms to provide moral guidance and redemption for a largely illiterate public. Furthermore, the public space, with no admission charges, founded in the wake of the public library movement, was seen as the critical tool in neutralizing class conflict and delivering social cohesion. Um, so there was a very clear political agenda. One of the um, uh, 
great aspects of the Whitechapel was that the um, director never patronised his audience. He was always concerned to bring them the very best. Um, here is a facade drawing of the Whitechapel Gallery with the old library building that was co-founded with it and which we have acquired and which we're expanding into. This was the great library which has moved to a new building and uh, seven years ago my predecessor, Catherine Lampert, negotiated with the local council to, to buy the building. The week I started in 2001, I had to sign a contract to spend a million pounds on buying it which was terrifying, and um, so I found everybody I knew and they said, are you mad, this is the greatest opportunity the White Chapel's ever had, buy it, so we did. Um, and so this is, uh, this is going to be a little bit of a case study for us. Um, at the beginning, in 1901, they had a great picture show, and like all, at, all museum displays at the time, it was based on this. This is a painting by David Tenniers from uh, 1651, um, title art, well, you see the title there. And as you can see, it was the convention of stacking uh, paintings in a salon style, um, hang one above the other, um, arranged actually by size, not content, um, and they would typically be against different, very deep colours, and you can still see it in many museums today. It was a convention that was repeated in the Louvre, in uh, the Royal Academy, and you can still see it in the presentation of historic works. And sure enough, uh, the Whitechapel Gallery followed in, in the wake of this. Um, and their very first show in 1901, which was 300 years of great British art, and they had Constable and Turner and Gainsborough, pre-Raphaelites, was displayed in this manner. Um, the American critic Brian O'Doherty, uh, who's the author of the very famous book on the White Cube, describes this system of exhibition making as follows. Each picture was seen as a self-contained entity, totally isolated from its slum class neighbour, slum close neighbour, by heavy frames around, and a complete perspectival system within. Space was discontinuous and categorizable, just as the houses in which these paintings hung had rooms for different functions. The 19th century mind was taxonomic, and the 19th century eye recognised hierarchy of, hierarchies of genre and the authority of the frame. So this was a very, very widespread convention. And what I want to demonstrate is how it's been used, abused, and actually reinvented. Um, the, this kind of uh, use of framing and hanging in the East End is also resonant of great country houses. So it was kind of an, an interesting offer to the very poorest of people, and it reminds me of the Moscow Underground, designed as a palace, that you would have this very, very grand space for the poorest illiterate people, free of charge, they could come in and believe for a moment that they were in a great aristocratic house. When, um, however, this has been you know, also criticised because it was seen as a sort of form of escapism. The same historian Seth Coven comments, <laughs> The catalogue description of the exhibitions as a whole strove to create the illusion that workers were actively promoting their self-betterment by viewing art, when in fact they were being diverted from directly challenging the basis of power in society. So here we see the idea of the salon as a kind of distraction or escapism through the, the painting and the wind and the frame of the painting as a window into another world. This was to be directly challenged and used in an, in an ironic way by, of course, the um, uh, Russian constructivists. And here, the last futurist exhibition of paintings by Malevich. You can see it's, a, it's almost like a pastiche of a salon hand, but of course it's all abstract. And most importantly, in the corner where the icon in a Russian house would normally be situated is the, the famous paradigmatic black square. So we can see how he takes that convention and then uh, kind of turns it upside down. It was in 1929 that MoMA delivered the final death knell to the Salon Hang. Um, and uh, Margaret Scolari Barr, who was the partner of a uh, wife of um, Albert Barr, Alfred Barr, sorry, wrote about this retrospectively when he decided to no longer stack pictures on top of each other in this brand new museum. She says, there were no pictures above other pictures, all the walls were neutral, and the pictures were hung intellectually, chronologically, 
Previously, the walls would be either panelling or else they would be brocade, red brocade, blue brocade, green brocade, which would suck the colour out of the pictures. Instead, the idea was to let the pictures stand on their own feet. So here we see the, the evolution of a new convention of white walls, of single paintings, all separated from each other, and really hung in relation to the viewer's body. So it's a paradigm shift, and it revolutionized the way that we hang works of art in museums and in temporary exhibitions. However, in 1981, the British artists Gilbert and George decided to go back to the Salon Hang. And here we have this wonderful installation from the Whitechapel where they use the conventions of the Salon Hang and also, I would say, the church. Um, certainly the um, uh, critic and historian and curator Marco Livingstone has talked about the colours in Gilbert and George as being, of course, akin to stained glass. Um, but what's interesting here is that they take these two conventions, the Salon Hang and the church, but what they show is their object of desire, which was white working class men, young men. So here we have something that was still taboo in 1980s London, um, which was this very dramatic um, display of a homoerotic um, celebration but within these conventions of the Salon and the church. 2001, Nan Golden does the similar thing. Uh, she plays with this salon and church motif in a big retrospective called Devil's Playground. Uh, again, rejecting chronology, she edited clusters of work into narrative sequences. She used deep purple, emerald, crimson, and black, and stacked and juxtaposed images to evoke the bells and smells of Catholic, medieval, and Baroque churches. Friends, lovers, and babies were transformed into Madonnas, Pietas, and Puti, death masks, and memento mori. Both projects jettison the neutrality of the white cube to reiterate the atmosphere of a white chapel. Yet the return of the repressed did not inaugurate a new morality, rather the space was occupied by images of the profane. Part two, gallery as theater. The concept of the, the um, theatrum mundi, the, the theater of the world, which comes through drama, philosophy, um, I think can also be um, attached to our ideas about museum and exhibition spaces, where the gallery becomes a kind of stage set, where other worlds are mirrored, where dramas are enacted, where there are clues, scenarios, um, and also the, the spectator themselves becomes a player, becomes an, an, they animate the scene. This is an exhibition from the Whitechapel in 1902, based on a picture of Japan. Um, it offered a vast display of art and life in Japan, and included carvings, bronzes, lacquer furniture, books, musical instruments, and color prints. It reconstructed a Japanese room, a model of a tea house, and a full-blown temple, providing a living geography lesson, which was in the catalogue, it sought to present an exotic and utterly westernized notion of an oriental culture. Now the origins of this kind of world, of this kind of exhibition making, of course, was in the world fairs, um, where Europe really demonstrated its, its colonies, its empires, um, and also it paraded its idea about nationalism. Very important at the turn of the 19th century, this idea of establishing nationhood, and also of imaging the nations of others around the world. And so this kind of creation was a way of um, establishing different identities, establishing a kind of rhetoric of power, um, and then continued in world affairs really up until the Second World War um, with the um, things like the Mies Pavilion and the standoff between the Russian and German pavilions, the Albert Speer versus the Constructivist Pavilion in 1933. So this is the kind of origin of it, but it's also interesting, I think, in terms of creating this exotic space within the gallery, that it is theatrical, um, and it will lead, as we will see, to a kind of um, critique of the ultimate theatricality of the theme park. Um, this idea of a, of a theatrical space, of play, um, is, again, here, this wonderful work by Marcel Duchamp, called The First Papers of Surrealism. This was an exhibition held in 1942 in the ballroom of the White Law Reed Mansion in New York. 
Um, and Marcel Duchamp worked with two sisters to weave a web of 16 miles of thread throughout the otherwise traditionally displayed modern paintings selected by André Bresson and representing uh, a whole influx of European emigres. First papers referred to the displaced status of the artists and the papers they needed to get to enter America in the 1940s. Um, this great uh, retrospective exhibition uh, was tied up with string for the Vernissage. Um, and basically, Duchamp, he renamed it, um, he made it into a kind of gigantic web called the Mile of String. And then for the opening, he invited children to come and play ball in the room. So you couldn't get, if you'd gone in there, you got tangled up, you could be hit on the head with a ball. It made it almost impossible to see the works. It's a fantastic kind of way of animating space. It's very playful, very theatrical, but also incredibly frustrating. Um, so I, I think this is a wonderful uh, model of a kind of theatricality. Um, 1956, This Is Tomorrow, um, followed a similar model where a whole group of artists and architects collaborated. 1955 was the year when Mary Quant, I don't know if anyone's old enough to know about Mary Quant, opened her first boutique. The Conrad Design Group was formed and the first commercial television channel was launched in Britain. Um, this is Tomorrow, presented at the Whitechapel Gallery in 1956, encapsulated a vision of the modern in the mass-produced present of the everyday, created through group activity. The project was devoted to the possibilities of collaboration between architects, painters and sculptors. There were 12 groups that included artists such as Richard Hamilton, Nigel Henderson, Eduardo Carlozzi, Victor Passmore, Kenneth and Mary Martin, and the architects included Erno Goldfinger, Alison and Peter Smithson, Jim Sterling, and Colin St. John Wilson. The aesthetic of each of the 12 groups could be roughly defined as neoconstructivist or proto-pop art. Um, I'm very sorry to say that I don't have the installation shots. Um, something happened with my CD, and I will have to read them to you. But basically what they did was that they transformed the Whitechapel into a series of stage sets. There was a full-size model of Robbie the Robot, borrowed by Richard Hamilton from the set of the film Forbidden Planet. The list of components, deployed by Group 2, Hamilton, McHale and John Walker, <coughs> created a cultural and phenomenological environment that incorporated the spectator in what would later be termed an installation. The components included optical illusions inspired by the Bauhaus, images from cinema and science fiction, a jukebox, a 16-foot high image of Robbie the Robot carrying Marilyn Monroe, a giant bottle of Guinness, a spongy floor that when stepped on emitted strawberry air freshener, <laughs> a bubble sculpture you could immerse yourself in, a total collage effect of a, cinema, of a cinemascope panel. The show was seen by a thousand people a day. The project witnessed the impact of technology, mass media, commerce and consumerism and voiced a commitment to a dense, ubiquitous culture which challenged the good taste of official British art at that time. This is tomorrow encapsulated an approach to contemporary culture which hovered, in Richard Hamilton's words, between cynicism and reverence. Inspired by new fields of perception and opticality opened up by science, and new structures opened up by developments in material and building technologies, the installations presented in This Is Tomorrow marked a revolution in the gallery environment. 1968, Elio Otisika um, came to London, uh, found it gloomy and depressing, and of course it rained. He came from Brazil and was appalled. Um, the French critic Jean Christophe Royot comments about this time and what artists were doing. Art was conceived as a critical model able to explore various forms of the individual social, psychic, or linguistic integration to reality informed and deformed by all pervasive and power of mass culture. The aim of art, broadly aligned with other manifestations of 60s counterculture, was therefore clear, to expose the spectator within the framework of a defined spatial environment to a theatricalized experience, offering the means of access to alternative modes of self-fashioning. <coughs> so, uh, Oitasika came and he found uh, some stables and he imported uh, from the stables hay, he came in with sand, and he built these structures where you 
um, in a way, disappeared from the outside world and entered this um, carnivalist space which he'd created. And this is a way to see her writing at that time. And he says, structures became general, given, open to collective, casual, momentary behavior. In Whitechapel, the behavior opens itself up to whoever arrives and bends forward into the creative environment from the cold London streets, repetitive, closed, and monumental, and recreates himself as if back to nature, to the childhood warmth, to allowing oneself to become absorbed. Self-absorption in the uterus of the constructed open space which more than gallery or shelter this space becomes. So you get this incredible idea of not just a theatre but a womb, that the gallery becomes a space for rebirth, that you become immersed in sight, touch, phenomenological experiences, sensation, tactility, um, and play. Uh, he, uh, the Jeu de Pomme in Paris, and then later actually again at the Whitechapel, we remade some other environments of his, which required people to take off their shoes and lie down. And it was a very weird experience because people felt very vulnerable, very, you know, did they have a hole in their sock, did the feet smell, you know, all of those kinds of uh, self-conscious feelings about revealing one's body. And then lying down with strangers, very uncomfortable, but very liberating. Just being, uh, not being vertical in a public space, lying on the floor. It's a big statement. And we usually typically associate lying down with vulnerability, or sex, or death, or accident. So just to lie down in a public space, he actually made the viewer part of the work of art. You become almost in the uh, tradition of the reclining nude, you become the figure that's on display. Um, this is uh, an installation by the LA artist Paul McCarthy. Um, and this was presented at the White Chapel very recently uh, in 2006. Um, and Paul McCarthy took the gallery as a studio, excuse me, and here he is, uh, a life-size figure of McCarthy. And what happens is that we enter his mind, we enter his dream. And he dreams, of course, of Hollywood and of Disneyland and of the Pirates of the Caribbean. And he creates this extraordinary um, and orgiastic, so we'll go back to these, uh, to this island where there are a number of galleons. Um, if any of you have been to Disneyland, you'll remember Pirates of the Caribbean. There's an, a fake island that you go around in a boat. On that island, he imagined a series of buccaneers of hyperphallicized buffoons and cutthroats who were then made real um, with enormous uh, phallic uh, interventions in their heads and faces. Uh, there was a pig which was uh, part of a kind of scene of orgiastic bestiality. I mean, it was an extraordinary tour de force. Um, and I wanted to finish with this in the theatre, because in a way it goes back to empire, and it goes back to the idea of American imperialism, and of Disneyland, the theme park, and the Kismo, and how they all come together in this extraordinary installation. Um, we also went off-site, so the gallery became uh, the, the space of the, the artist's imagination, and we found this enormous warehouse around the corner called the Copper Mills, where I'm uh, reliably told that the Cray twins, who are notorious gangsters, uh, buried many of their corpses underneath the floor of the space. Um, and we presented three full-size galleons there with projected films of these orgiastic rites of the most extraordinary ritual slaughter where, of course, the blood is replaced with ketchup um, and the shit is, of course, uh, liquid chocolate. And here we have some of the characters that Paul McCarthy filmed, projected in this space, um, and, excuse me, which uh, are then animating it. And I, I, I would draw your attention also as a kind of example of this very theatrical use of space to the current exhibition at the power plant, which I've I thought was very, very interesting. Scott Lyle, who um, has created this, uh, it's, a, it's called the Power Colour Ballroom, and I, I felt it was very much in this kind of uh, genre of creating this very theatrical series of props and clues. He has uh, stage lights which move around the space, 
Um, and I, you know, I think it's a, a very, very interesting installation. For those of you who haven't seen it, I would urge you to visit it. Um, here's another kind of configuration of gallery space. The Gallery of the Art. Um, and in 1920, the Dada, again using the Salon Hang, created this installation with this famous figure, um, which was um, uh, based on um, uh, a Prussian airman, I think, who is wearing a pig's head. Um, and it's this kind of absurd space where the whole gallery becomes a sort of collage, an assemblage of slogans, uh, of strange, surreal juxtapositions, of kind of erotic and violent interventions. <coughs> um, here's another example of, uh, quite differently, this is an amazing installation by Richard Long from 1971, where um, this exhibition, which only lasted two weeks, uh, Richard Long, um, who was known at that time for his work in walking <coughs> in faraway locations, who with many land artists, we only knew his work through photographs, through documentation, through the kind of indexing of these works. So they were a rumour. And he came into the White Chapel and he made these two very, very simple works. One, this cross made of earth, the other, this spiral made of white pebbles. At the end of the exhibition, they were swept up and thrown away. Um, and this is, I think, a very significant moment in this idea of the gallery as the work of art. For a start, we have something which is framed by the, the volume of the space. Uh, it's something which has no props, no frame, no support. It's on the horizontal, it's, it's part of the floor, and you become part of it as you walk through and around it. Um, the ephemeral nature of it, of course, uh, refers not only, I think it's a kind of partly reference to his contemporary Robert Smithson, um, we think of course of Spiral Jetty, uh, but also its ephemerality relates to the ephemerality of nature itself, of cycles in nature. Um, and uh, again, Marco Livingstone has commented, they're a physical manifestation of the transference of the heart of nature itself, um, but its impact is based on the fact that it would have such a brief existence as a physical entity Works such as this have heightened one's excitement about exhibitions as unique, unrepeatable experiences, set apart from the displays of permanent collections offered by museums. So it's a very interesting thing that this is a one-off unique experience which will never be repeated. And I think that's another kind of very significant thing about this work. I think its horizontality is also that we don't have this vertical relationship with a viewer, that actually it's lying at your feet. Um, another great model in this is, of course, the pioneering work uh, done by the Deer Foundation. Um, and uh, this has been, for me, tremendously influential. Um, these, uh, this is a, a remarkable work that you will find if you take a walk through Soho in Manhattan, uh, go to Worcester Street, find a little grey door with DIA painted on it, push it, go up the stairs, and you find yourself in this loft filled with earth. It's huge, by the way. And it's been there since 1977. So by contrast with the Richard Long, which was thrown in the bin, here's something which never changes. And one's relationship to this is really to go on a pilgrimage. And I go and pay homage to this uh, every time I go to New York. It's interesting that it's cut off from you. You can't enter it. So it's a more kind of reverential uh, relationship, I suppose, with the spectator. Um, and there is a... Uh, an, uh, uh, if you call it sister, a brother piece, um, called The Broken Kilometre. Uh, this is sublimely beautiful. Um, again, you can't enter this space, you're kept slightly at bay. And a curator called Thomas Klein has written about the experience of seeing this work, which, by the way, is also um, relates conceptually to an older work he made in Castle, where he sunk a whole kilometre of brass rod into the ground. All you can see, and it's still there outside the Fredericiano Museum, is the top of it. And it's an act of faith that you believe that there is a kilometre of brass rod beneath that circle, and there is. So here's, a, here's a, a description of the experience of seeing this. There's a faint hint of incense. The calm that you sense on entering the gallery is only intensified by the creaking of old floorboards. Outside, we have left behind us countless boutiques, passers-by, and clamorous restaurants. As soon as we step inside, 
passing a low wall where, these are brochures, where there are brochures laid out, the magnificent work greets us. 500 gleaming gold-colored rods receding into the distance, laid out majestically in a five-sectioned plain. Our gaze, roses, uh, our gaze roams to and fro, lingering on columns, a double window on the left wall, a white rope in front of us at knee height. Do not enter, just look. A devotional image with no figure of Mary, no Joseph, no Lord God, just pure brass, illuminated by some other sun for our benefit alone, it seems. Uh, so it's a very evocative description of this work. Um, and uh, it's a space which also evokes another piece called The Lightning Field, which is in Quemada in New Mexico. Um, and in a way, Walter Maria, I think, is connecting up the dots. So our minds are both very much in the here and now of this extraordinary, uh, almost internal landscape, which is sublime in its dimensions and perspective. And the knowledge of these other pieces, one buried deep below the ground, another reaching up to the sky. So it's an extraordinary uh, kind of sculptural statement where the gallery is part of the mechanism of the meaning of the structure of the work. Um, and uh, I think a, a great contemporary example of this is the work of Liam Gillick, a British artist who's based now in New York. Um, and he took over the a gallery and created it as a kind of architectonic structure. Uh, it's clearly got uh, references to Donald Judd in the use of perspex. For Judd, the fact that perspex was coloured internally and not painted, it has a kind of truth to material, is very, very important. And Gillick uh, picks up on that and creates these architectonic structures where you, you yourself pass through the, the labyrinth of spaces that he creates. You change colour, by the way, as you go through. And there are texts which float behind screens, above you. Um, so it's, he kind of choreographs space so that you yourself become enmeshed in this kind of discourse. Sorry. Um, and he calls these what-if scenarios. Uh, it's a very compelling concept. It's very utopian, of course. And it's the idea of a proposition. Um, this, uh, like actually the Scott Lyle exhibition, is a retrospective. In it, in this installation, were all these other old works that he made, but he reconfigured them into a single piece. Um, they also have this kind of slightly stained glass feel, this is a slightly reverential feel, and it was called the Woodway. And the Woodway relates to a German word, Holzweg, which means deriving from, the, from a path cut by foresters, uh, that you have unwittingly taken a wrong turn and lost yourself in metaphorical thickets. <laughs> so that is the meaning of it. And he, um, within this uh, labyrinth, creates uh, so-called discussion islands, where he wants people to bump into each other, to see each other through these screens, and to have some kind of interaction. And all of these things have fed into our thinking about our new space, because we have this beautiful um, reading room, a former of the uh, reading room of the library, and we're going to transform it into a gallery where uh, we give it over to one artist and they can create one work of art which will be in situ for a whole year. Um, and the thinking behind this is very much uh, influenced by people like Gillick and before him, Dear, and what you've seen here. This is a cutaway of our new extension, and this space is at the bottom. In fact, this was done some years ago, and we're not going to have white walls anymore, we have brick walls. And the idea of this new space, where the gallery itself will be the work of art, is that it can, anything can be done to it. It can be pounded or drilled, or any kind of uh, process can, can take place there. It has no uh, climate control, and the idea is that a single artist will have complete control over it. Collecting collections. Um, I'll try and be quick. We don't have a collection, um, and yet when I was working at Tate, it's an extraordinary experience to be able to work with one, um, and one I maintain my hunger for. So we thought, well, we don't have one, why not borrow them? So this indeed is what we're going to do. And um, part of my, uh, our thinking as a team, we were inspired by an, a museum in Austria, in Vienna, the Museum of Applied Arts, 
where the uh, director, Peter Noble, simply closed the whole thing down for, I think, five years, um, and handed it, just went through this ancient, vast holding of decorative arts, and invited 10 artists to rehang the whole thing. Um, and this was, and also in some ways counterintuitively, so here he asked Donald Judd, of all people, to work with the fiddliest, twiddly d 18th century cabinet making, and uh, Judd accepts the invitation, and he makes this extraordinary room within a room, where he replicates the moulding, you can see at the top there, um, and it's almost like uh, Stanley Kubrick's 2001, it reminds me of, but here is this weird capsule that he creates inside this huge space and in Judd-esque fashion creates a symmetry where he juxtaposes all the furniture so it's in direct symmetry with each other. And uh, here's a statement that he makes about it. Um, he says, the room and most of the other furniture were made in the 18th century for the aristocracy. The room's grandeur is uncertain and therefore excessive. The separate pieces of furniture are placed symmetrically, usually in pairs, usually opposite each other. A rectangular space usually determines this. The positioning of the furniture was also carefully decided with regard to the size, colour and type of each piece. Um, I asked for part of the moulding under the ceiling of the large room to be repeated around the exterior of this is called the Dubsky room to further incorporate it into the 18th century space made in the 19th century and to reduce the excessive generality of its exterior. This is a small, uneasy room, uneasily placed in a large, doubly uneasy room. I think it should be in the basement. But Vic Doring, who was the curator, and I did our best une uneasily. Um, here's another uh, installation by Jenny Holzer. Um, and here she talks about Biedermeyer furniture. She decided to work with this, which is the moment when the techniques of not mass production, but certainly, not as we know it today, but certainly the beginnings of mass production, enabled ordinary people to have fine uh, porcelain, for example, and furniture. And she says, I never liked museum labels and brochures. I wanted to find another system to present information about the collection and about the times in which the objects were made. I tried to think of an appealing way to show a superabundance of text on Biedermeyer and Empire. I chose electronic signs with large memories to talk about why and what was produced for whom. The signs display the predictable facts and softer materials, such as personal letters of the period. Because some people hate to read in museums, I placed the signs near the ceiling so they can be ignored. <laughs> To encourage people who might read, I varied the science programmes and included special effects. For serious, exhausted readers, I provided an aluminium mock Biedermeyer sofa on which to sit. I also rearranged the furniture, silverware, glassware and porcelain, as would any good housewife. <coughs> this incredibly beautiful installation by Barbara Bloom takes phonics chairs and celebrates their amazing uh, silhouettes. And she creates this almost like a sort of catwalk. And her text is she sees this as a movie. The movie synopsis would read something like this Michael Follett, a German chair designer, so impressed an Austrian prince with his elegant designs and innovative manufacture techniques that he was commissioned to design some woodworking for a palace in Vienna. It's a good docudrama with a clear linear narrative. I'd like to see the part of Follett played by someone like Nick Nolte. Accented and convincingly depicting his long and eventual life. There would be international trade fair, first prizes, certainly several Vienna cafe scenes, and perhaps a factory class conflict. Good plot. But I really look forward to, and I hope I live long enough to see this, a made for interactive video docudrama about the life of Ingvar Kamprad, the founder of IKEA. This late 20th century prototype of business success needs no introduction, but in the future it will be well remembered as a marketer of great appeal to a wide range of customers. From most European intellectuals who file their libraries on Billy bookshelves, familiar to anyone here? Uh, to young one and a half kid families who were helped over the hurdle of spending money by IKEA's clever tactic of giving every object in their catalogue a proper name. So imagine a double bill of these two movies. Together they form a good paradigm of progress. So here is a, a wonderful selection of bentwood chairs and seen in a, in a kind of cinematic way. 
Uh, another inspiration in Cambridge, in Britain, uh, a, a Tate curator called Jim Ede, who befriended all the artists that were uh, acquired by the Tate. Um, he, was a, he was a contemporary of the St. Ives School, um, and of course, actually, of the late Vorticists. And um, if you ever go to Cambridge, to Kettles Yard, University Gallery, they have his house. And all his objects, and all works of art, are still there alongside with his you know, pots and pans and his furniture. And here's another way of seeing a collection. Um, and uh, some of you may have uh, seen it in Paris at the Maison Rouge about four years ago, a new uh, initiative where two collectors um, gave over a whole building to 10 friends, all of whom had good collections in France, and they remade one person's bathroom, one person's bedroom, another person's sitting room, a study, a kitchen, and so forth, in exact facsimile, and then hung works from their homes in this simulated home. And so visitors could see how those collectors live with their works. So it's a kind of all sorts of interesting ideas about how you show collections. Our plan is that we will show one public collection over a period of a year. In Britain, I don't know if it's true of Canada, but the British Council, the Arts Council, are very, very busily buying works of art, but they have no home, because they're off doing good works in embassies in you know, Sao Paulo. Um, so what, for a year, we're going to dig into that collection. They have 8,000 objects. Um, and they bought, when artists were hungry and there wasn't much money around, they bought fantastic things. So we're going to have a series of displays with artists curating, all sorts of ways of displaying the collection uh, using these kinds of strategies. Um, in year two, we're going to look at private collections. As we all know, there are some extraordinary bodies of work. Private collectors often break the rules. They'll make the strangest juxtapositions, which we curators would never dare to do but actually are quite revelatory. Um, so I want to um, work with private collectors and bring back into the public arena uh, some very, very significant works which are in private holdings. It's obviously great for artists to be acquired by collectors. It's crucial for their lifeblood, but those works of art do disappear. And we also know many people who find that their works of art sit in crates, often for decades. So we want to bring those works of art back into the public realm. Archive Adventures, we, for our new project, did get some money from the Heritage Lottery Fund and the challenge was to do something with our archive. Um, there are, of course, things that we regard as dry, dusty, boring and in a basement cardboard box. But I think initially if you look at what artists are doing, people like Wally Durand, um, there's a, an increasing interest in the archive as a kind of um, metier or, or as a source material. Um, and so we're going to have a gallery dedicated to the history of exhibition making. Um, and uh, we ourselves, our only collection is our past. It's our hundred years of documents and correspondence uh, of things that we were given by artists. Um, and what we will do is have a gallery where we can display those and put them back into context. For example, 1939, the Stepney Trade Union, which was the local Communist Party, came to the Whitechapel, knocked on the door and said, we want to do an exhibition to raise consciousness about the Spanish Civil War. We have a young artist who wants to use your space. The Whitechapel said, forget it, we're not interested. So they came back and said, we'll pay, 25 guineas. Anyway, the artist was Picasso, and the uh, work was Guernica. Uh, and it's the only time it's ever been shown in Britain. Um, this was an amazing moment because uh, Picasso um, really created this as a kind of propaganda tool which toured around Europe. Um, and this is a picture of Clement Attlee, who came and spoke in front of the, the painting and persuaded Eastenders to go and fight in Spain. I mean, hundreds of people actually went, fought, lost their lives there. The other interesting thing about this was that the price of entry suggested by Picasso was a pair of shoes. And anyone who could afford it was asked to bring a pair of boots and to donate it and leave it underneath the painting. And by the end of the show, there were two or three hundred pairs of shoes lined up under the painting. So it's an amazing moment where you've got this art and exhibition spaces as a space of propaganda, um, but also as of kind of social and political activism. 
Uh, this idea of reinvigorating the past, of going back to an archival moment, uh, is something that we also did through a series of projects called the Short History of Performance. We're up to part five, actually. Uh, this was part one, and we recreated key performance, works of performance art that we'd only ever read about, that had been basically black and white photographs. Now, this is a work by Yanis Kunanis, um, first presented in Rome in 1969. And he um, had 12 horses in a garage space um, in Rome. And so we did the same thing. We, got 12, we worked with Kunanis, and he came and gave us permission to recreate this piece. And I have to tell you, it was one of the most moving things I've ever experienced. I'm not quite sure why. We had 12 horses in the gallery for a day. They're big, they're beautiful, and they're very dangerous. Or you feel that they're dangerous because they could kick you. And you've got this real sense, again, of the sublime. It was a very moving and very extraordinary experience of being with these 12 creatures, living creatures in this space. And what was interesting was that they themselves struck equestrian poses. So they would have one, <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, who farmed as it were. Um, we had to learn what to do with horse urine, which um, apparently can stay, the smell can stay on the wooden floor for 25 years. So we had to deck out the space, I and mean, it was a big, a big enterprise. But um, one felt very privileged to be able to re enter a moment in history, but also see it in the terms of our, our own time. Um, and this kind of sense of, in a way, loss or longing for nature and the inexplicable and also indifferent um, nature of nature. Um, gallery as transmitter. If we've got these big institutions that are growing exponentially, I think they've got to give us a lot back. Um, and so, obviously, debates. This is uh, our auditorium uh, with seat covers designed by Liam Gillick. Um, and I think like the power plant and, and AGM and various institutions the idea of art and ideas is absolutely critical, that we need to understand art in its context, to understand the theories and speculations about art, and we do a series called Big Ideas, where we um, get those people who usually only address, um, who are academics, who usually only speak to students or each other, to come into the public realm and to deliver important lectures, which have offered paradigm shifts. Uh, in art discourse. Um, we've had a great series of speakers. Um, it's a series inspired actually by work that Helena did years ago at the ICA, but it's really getting that kind of sense of dialogue and confrontation with ideas. And that led to the series that uh, she mentioned. These are called Documents of Contemporary Art. It's a growing series, um, inspired by watching my partner, who's a teacher, running around making photocopies on these big themes for his students. And I'm thinking, actually, why don't we just publish them all in the book? We have guest editors who come and pull together all the most exciting texts on the archive, participation, the everyday, and so on. So this is, while we've been closed doing our building work, has given me the chance to carry on publishing. Um, and uh, these are, I hope you'll find these books useful. Um, we're also, I think one of the great things about this rise of institutions is the opportunity to work together. Um, and while we've been closed, we've just had a project space, our auditorium. And, you know, it's, it's a black box. We've all got them. All our museums have these spaces. And what do we do with them? Not enough. We have them for talks and weekend events. And I just figured, well, there's a space every day sitting empty. And there's so much work currently being made, really important work, in the moving image, that we thought this was a space where we could present every day moving image work. Uh, as an exhibition. So for six weeks we feature one artist, it's a walk-in, walk-out space uh, going through the day. Now speaking to colleagues about this, it became clear that everybody had this box. So we now have a, um, a consortium and the exciting thing about this is that we now have a colleague in Istanbul, Argentina, Los Angeles, uh, Oslo, um, there are ten cities taking part in this project and each curator at uh, Beijing one curator in each city nominates the artist and then we all show them on general release. It's cheap, it's a DVD, uh, you put it in the post, you switch it on, and there it is, there's your show. 
And each curator also adds a text on the internet. So there's this growing body of discourse around these works. For me, it's been exciting because I found out about people I knew nothing about. Uh, we've just shown a, a, an amazing artist from Norway. It's a way of, uh, I think, part of our responsibility as curators is to kind of spread the word about local artists, exciting work that we know about and that we want to share with not only colleagues but audiences. Uh, and then finally, going out of the gallery, um, behind us is a very, very interesting street. Um, at one end is um, a curry house, um, a convent, a big public housing estate which is 90% Bengali. Uh, there is a pavement where girls from Eastern Europe sell their bodies to lorry drivers. It's, it's very, very heavy and quite depressing. Um, there's a pub and there's a huge market called Petticoat Lane Market, which is one of the oldest clothing markets in London, which is struggling in the face of Walmart and Primark and you know, cheap clothing. Um, and we thought it would be interesting, while we were closed, and actually anyway, to reach out to the various communities in the street. On the one side, we've got abject poverty, there's a soup kitchen for the homeless, and right at the other end, you can see a bit of the tower there, this gherkin, which has become a kind of symbol of the city, is indeed the city, the richest engine of you know, British finance. So you go from poverty to wealth in one street. And we um, invite a number of us to go and work in this context. Um, and so, for example, Nedko Solokov uh, worked with the street traders um, and he asked members of the public to spend a minimum of five pounds and to buy one object from the market, which he then displayed, we, we have a shop, to display in the shop, which will then become a kind of time capsule of consumer buying in 2007, uh, uh, yeah, uh, 2008, sorry. Um, and then there's gonna be a lottery where the lucky winner, um, this is the instructions of what to do, the lucky winner gets this drawing. And we will have a draw, I think, next, uh, uh, next spring. Um, Bernd Krauss, a German artist, set this camera up on the top of a tower block on this street um, and made a film based on the go toings and throwings of the communities there. And he had all sorts of projects, including the Whitechapel staff. We, um, about two years ago, decided that we were going to learn German and we hired a German tutor, and the first uh, lesson there were 18 people, the last lesson there were two. So as a punishment, Bernd Krauss had all the people who dropped out of the German class clean the facade of this wonderful local German church. It's a wonderful German church, rather neglected, and as a punishment he had us all clean that. Um, he also had a fire cell at the end of the the project where he'd done community workshops with, in this council, uh, uh, public housing high-rise, where people had made pots and done all sorts of activities, and then there was a sale at the end of it in the marketplace. This is uh, the artist Shimabuku, who um, built this wonderful cardboard box which he slept in at the beginning of the exhibition. And he made uh, a documentary film, beautiful, about the life of the cardboard boxes that, that move around the street. He's famous for this uh, octopus project where he moved this octopus around, a living octop octopus. Um, and he also made cocktails, which he uh, had on sale in the various little cafes and bars around the area. And the film about the cardboard boxes is really extraordinary because, of course, we never noticed them. And I realised that there was one guy on the street who makes an entire shop a shoe shop out of cardboard boxes every day and then takes it down at the end of the day. And I've never noticed it. And sure enough, he's there. And then he found the kind of secret love life of boxes where they nestle up together in corners or <laughs> there were twin boxes or there were uh, kind of sculptural installations made by the traders or boxes used to carry lunch takeaways. It was a fantastic project. Um, I mean, Perrier who made photographs of all the local people. They could come and, and have their photos and they're all exhibited there, and they come and point themselves out to each other. Um, so uh, this is Jens Hanning, who is, has installed clock, a clock in uh, Brick Lane, which has Baghdad local time, um, to try and get us to connect with, with the atrocities and what's happening there. So this was a way of 
reaching out to these different uh, communities, coming up Henry VIII's wives, will be um, re, uh, trying to remake bits of Tatlin's Tower. And the shop, when you come, as I hope you will, uh, will in November will be the foyer of Tatlin's Tower, as it might have been designed. And a Mexican artist called Minerva Cuevas is coming up, and we don't quite know what she's going to do. And Canal are a group who are documenting the whole project. Before we go there. Um, the, I think for us all, the challenge is how do we connect to this huge, heterogeneous um, idea of audience and public? Who are they? What does it mean? Um, and I think our ideas about community have really changed during this kind of project. Um, and it's something that I want to you know, build on and to see how we can capture that relationship that has been initiated by artists and continue to build on it. I think that's going to be the real challenge. Will those street traders come through, through our door next April when we, when we supposedly open? Uh, so I think that's a challenge for us all, is how do we connect people? How do we work with artists to make those relationships? I'm going to finish now. Um, I just wanted to end with um, our very proud moment, which we're going to unveil actually next week. Um, about when we applied for money for our big project, uh, you have, you, um, uh, in Britain we have a statutory body called the English Heritage, and every listed building has to be passed through them, whatever you want to do. English Heritage looked at our plans for combining these two spaces and said, and where is the weather vane? <laughs> and we said, what weather vane? Um, and sure enough, they'd been through our records and found that the library had a drawing of a weather vane, never built. But they insisted that we put one back. <laughs> two weeks later, this is so extraordinary, two weeks later, Rodney Graham comes in, who we did a big show with, comes in for lunch, and I asked him what he's doing. And he said, well, I've just had my photograph taken, dressed as Erasmus, <laughs> sitting on a horse backwards, um, reading or writing uh, in praise of folly. Really, what are you going to do with it? I'm going to make a weather vane. <laughs> well, I couldn't believe my ears. It was like, this is extraordinary. And so, of course, we decided that we must have one. There's three, as you probably know. Um, and so, uh, topping off our great project will be this wonderful, one of, I think, Canada's greatest artists. And um, we are going to be uh, putting that on top of our building in the new year. But we're going to have a preview unveiling next as part of the um, freeze activities in London next week. Um, I'm just going to finish now with a quote from a colleague um, who, whose work I admire called Maria Lind. And something that I think us as curators and uh, anybody really involved in the exhibiting and collecting of work is probably relevant for us all. She says, how do you use the support of an institution and still have space for production and circulation in an experimental and flexible way? How do you have certain continuity Without the support of an institution, how do you circulate ideas and artistic projects, establishing an exchange among people from different economical, political, and cultural contexts on an equal level? So I think we must ask ourselves, that's uh, Maria's quote, I'm asking us all, I think, can we create structures that are both robust and transparent? Can we combine continuity, which is so necessary to build relationships with audiences, other institutions, artists, with the flexibility to embrace new modes of artistic production and reception. To be relevant in the 21st century, the gallery must be at once a permeable web, a black box, a white cube, a temple, a laboratory, a situation. It must take the form of the creative partnership between the curator, the producer, and the spectator. Thank you. Congratulations! I've, I've long been a fan of, of, of the of, of Whitechapel Thank and the, 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 the Spitalfield Market, the, the, the Brick Lane uh, area, um, and, and also for the uh, congratulations for the McCarthy Show. I thought it was one of the best things I'd seen in many, many years. Uh, my, my question is this: What do you see to be the role of of, of Whitechapel as as um, 
that whole East End, you mentioned Gurkin, you mentioned, I don't know if you mentioned the Olympics, but the whole East End is going to be yeah. transformed and yeah. it'll be a massive transformation. I know that, that uh, I wonder if, if, do, when you speak of community, do you mean the community of artists who live in the area or do you mean the community of, of South Asians who, 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 who are dominant in yeah. terms of population yeah. there? Uh, what do you see for the future? In that? Well, all of the above. I mean, I think um, it's true that in 2012, we are the happy hosts of the Olympics, um, which is not feeling, filling any of us with great enthusiasm, I have to say. But anyway, um, it's, it's an amazing moment in the city because it's like an enormous building site. So it's a very disruptive and slightly uh, volatile period, I think. Uh, however, there's going to be a lot more investment in the area in the East End. Uh, what I fear, I suppose, and may I also say, sorry about this, but please don't fuck up Queen Street. You know, I'm so depressed to see some condominium, bohemian style apartments, I think they're called. You know, it's a delicate ecosystem and we have the same problem. There's massive development. We're trying to hold the city at bay, actually, and 30, 40 storey buildings are going up as we speak. Um, and I think it's part of our role to try and keep that balance, that fragile ecosystem where artists, art spaces, laboratories can flourish, because otherwise it would become dead. And I think it, we could leave, we could end with something very sterile. We need to keep that grittiness and that uh, historic fabric of the building and that balance of community as well. What do you think of what they did to the market, and what do you expect from their plan? Well, Spitalfields Market is now uh, part offices and part, you know, antiques and so on. It, it's kind of, a, it's actually not a bad design, it's Norman Foster and I think he's managed to, to keep the integrity of it. But I do think that we're all in danger of killing what it is that makes our city so vibrant and such important cultural quarters. Um, and I, you know, I would urge you all, <laughs> don't, don't lose it because, you know, I love Queen Street and I can see it's being you know, encroached upon by big developments. And I really feel very, very passionately that we need to work with planners, with architects, with developers to try and keep that balance. Um, we, I think, going back to your first point, uh, we have a big um, commitment to artists. and We offer peer critiques. Uh, we do kind of one-day projects for anyone who's given up. For example, we did a show just for anyone who's given up or anyone who thinks they're just not fashionable enough or who's an outsider to do these one-off shows. And I was inspired by Four Walls in Brooklyn, which is a fantastic initiative in a garage where they do these weekend shows. One night only, you put the work up, you call out a theme, everybody down, and then the next day, there are benches, beers, discussion, and that's the end, you know. And I think uh, we do... Um, basically professional development, you know, how do I get a studio? How do I get a grant? So we do survival strategies, sessions really for artists, and I think we're unique in London in, in, in offering that. And we work with Space Studios, who are a big studio provider. Um, we also have an open submission show called the East End Academy, so, uh, and also this Art in the Auditorium project, it means that I can, uh, you know, I know of a local artist who I think would look great in Istanbul or, or Buenos Aires. And I think it's that working with artists and, and helping them to, to flourish. I think that's one of our key responsibilities, actually. Yeah. Um, uh, Ivana, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, it was very intelligent, very informative. And clearly it shows your kind of sense of pride in your programming, which I think is, uh, for an audience, very refreshing and very kind of, um, you're giving us energy. It's really fantastic. Thank you. Um, I almost see you as a kind of, um, almost like a Seth Siegel now, someone who's, uh, as a curator or as a publisher, is tapping into artistic initiatives. <laughs> and. Uh, in very interesting and innovative ways, uh, incorporating and even using those same strategies uh, in, a, in a curatorial uh, practice, uh, which I find very interesting. <clears throat> you began uh, speaking about the, the history of the Whitechapel, the kind of um, politics and social ideals that informed the formation of the institution. 
uh, and you give a wonderful narrative about uh, exhibition practice and the different models that historically have been developed. Um, I'm curious about how you're able to position your, your programming ideas with uh, current uh, funding priorities and, and local traditions and funding ideas that you're able to tap into in order to get support for, for your programming. Um, I think that there, there's a shift. I mean, we're lucky in that we do get a lot of support. 50% of our funding comes from government sources. You know, there's an arts council which we really cherish because they've really fought for this arm's length principle, as it's called. Um, and 50% comes from all sorts of statutory bodies, and then 50% we have to raise. Um, and I think there was a period when uh, there were a lot of so-called box ticking, where there was a definite move within government to try and instrumentalize art. And there were very, very uh, kind of social imperatives behind them. And I think it's kind of problematic. I mean, in some ways, but it's flattering to think that art is going to change society and, you know, uh, transform the environment and bring social inclusion and educate people. But it doesn't have to do that. And I do feel that we went very far in that direction where we were asked, in a way, only to, to, to evaluate our programmes in terms of numbers, you know, and diversity and so on. I mean, these are all good things. But I think in the end we need a balance, and I think that's been moving back into an idea of, well, at the heart of that is the integrity of the work of art itself. You know, that this idea of excellence is now the new buzzword. But I think that I welcome that, because I think, you know, inevitably politicians who are, want to prove that they're accountable, they need to win votes, are always trying to make art do something. You know, it's always good, it's going to be therapeutic or educational or something. It can never just be, you know, and that is very frustrating, I think, for all of us. Um, you know, <laughs> we need to keep that principle, I think, at the heart of all, all that we do. At the same time, of course, I'm blessed with the fact that we are free of charge, uh, except, weirdly enough, once a year, when the trustees about 50 years ago decided that we should charge once a year to enable us to do something very ambitious, like the Paul McCarthy show. Um, but then we have a free evening. But that makes a huge difference, I think, is that the free entry. And it, it's been a huge success in Britain that the government was persuaded to make Tate, uh, the British Museum, and the VNA free of charge. And attendances have just skyrocketed. I mean, it's been really phenomenal. Um, and even when Helen and I were at the ICA, there was a two pound charge, but it's still a barrier. There was some psychological thing about it. And I, I gather last week, historically, they dropped it, actually. And I, I think, actually, that, that's something that I, we're lucky to have, is the level of support that enables us to be free of charge. Um, I think beyond that, though, we do, as I know colleagues across Canada do, we put a lot of effort into our education programmes. And, of course, if you get the kid, hopefully you get the adult too, you know, so that's, that's part of that access. Yeah. Does that answer the question? Yeah, Sorry, right, it's a right, yeah. yeah. But my, my whole attitude to curating is still with pride. You know, and I've seen most of the ideas I get from artists. There's just no question about it. They are the best curators. And you know, that's where the inspiration, I think, um, usually comes. For coming to our third in this uh, year's session of Power Talks, organized in collaboration uh, with the Toronto International Art Fair. We've had two um, really fascinating presentations so far by Douglas Fogel, um, who spoke about the Carnegie International, and by Fumio Nanjo, who spoke about his work as a curator um, in Japan and also for the Singapore Biennale. So we've had some wonderful international perspectives, and I know that today's speaker will um, probably exceed our expectations. So it's a great pleasure to introduce Ivana Glaswick. Um, as a curator, writer, and museum director, Ivana is a dynamic force within the British art world. She's the director of London's Whitechapel Art Gallery and is in the process of spearheading their $26,000 million restoration of a former library building which adjoins the gallery. 
and that will become a major new arts resource for the city, and it's due to open next year. Um, before this, uh, Ivana was head of exhibitions and displays at Tate Modern, and she was involved in, uh, she played a very key role, probably, possibly the strongest role, in defining um, that world's, um, sorry, in defining one of the world's most popular art museums, and she was uh, integrally involved in um, thinking through how to uh, present their uh, displays with that sort of new conceptual approach to museum displays. Um, Ivana actually had trained as an artist, and um, I read somewhere that she didn't want to be a second-rate artist, so she um, gave it up in favour of curating, so um, maybe we lost a really brilliant artist, we certainly gained a really brilliant curator. And I think you can see her background as an artist in everything that she does. She takes an extremely innovative approach to everything that she does, and she has an incredible eye, as you will see, just from some of the artists that she's worked with. Um, but she takes this creative approach to everything she spearheads from her exhibitions to um, publishing projects. She's responsible for setting up the Contemporary Art Programme at Fine Press and has recently initiated a new publishing programme with the Whitechapel Art Gallery and MIT Press. Um, I can't remember what the, the books are called now, but there's one on participation that we have at the Power mm -hmm. Plant, there's one on the artist's joke, it's a terrific new series. Um, she also takes a very creative approach to, to teaching. She's um, been on the faculty of numerous institutions, but I think most sort of pivotally um, was one of the first tutors on the Royal College a Curatorial Studies Programme in London. She also takes a, a very um, fresh approach to uh, her new um, responsibilities as, as a director and a fundraiser. I just heard about a tour that she gave for some of their donors um, in which she rented a private jet and gave them a bird's eye view of land art throughout the US, which, you know, uh, wow. <laughs> so, um, we're really thrilled that Ivana could join us for this weekend, and it's been really fun taking her around Toronto. We went to a number of galleries yesterday, and of course to Louis Blanche, and um, her insights into what we've been looking at are invariably spot on. And um, you know, she, she made the nice comment yesterday that uh, Canada has um, really more than its fair share of really excellent contemporary artists, which of course we agree with, but it's nice to hear from someone like her. So um, thanks again, Ivana. Um, welcome. Museums. Should we just burn them down? <laughs> Artists certainly have thought so, and they've been telling us to do that for a very long time. Certainly in 1909, Filippo Marin uh, Emilio Marinetti, one of the futurists, called for the wholesale destruction. And he summed them up as cemeteries. Absurd abattoirs of painters and sculptors ferociously slaughtering each other. Cemeteries of empty exertion. Calvaries of crucified dreams, registries of aborted beginnings. From the very get-go, artists have sought to destroy institutions, to critique them, to pull them apart, um, and to make us all aware of the kind of power plays that are implicit within them. Um, not only in institutions, but also in the whole process of curating, acquiring works of art, and exhibiting them. In 1981, the American artist Mary Kelly commented, the exhibition system marks a crucial intersection of discourses, practices, and sites, which define the institutions of art within a definitive social formation. Moreover, it is exactly here, within this intertextual, interdiscursive network, that the work of art is produced as text. Taking this kind of, um, these two positions as a starting point, um, I wanted us to consider the institution today because they haven't gone away, they haven't been burnt down, they just get bigger and there's more of them. Um, and so we have to think about why. Why are they important? Why do they play such a key role in the cultural landscape? So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the um, institution as avatar. 
Now, how do I get that to be a full screen? Excuse me. I'm a technophobe. <laughs> analysis acts as a benchmark within a discourse which has evolved over the last century <coughs> and which has dissected the notion of the exhibition space. Crucially, it is artists who have interrogated the conventions of exhibition making and the transition of the gallery environment from academy to salon, from white cube to site, from space to situation. The exhibition space, be it museum or laboratory, can no longer be understood as neutral, natural or universal but rather as thoroughly prescribed by the psychodynamics of politics, economics, geography, and subjectivity. I'm going to use my own institution as a kind of case study, uh, because we're in transition, we're a 100-year-old public art gallery, we're a Kunsthalle, we have no collection, and we're about to double in size along with everybody else. So um, in terms of um, joining this kind of uh, model of growth, I thought it was an interesting time to step back and analyse what we could do, how we could do it, and what lessons to be learned from the past. We were founded in 1901, not by a great patron, but actually by a priest um, called Canon Barnett, who wanted to bring great art to the people of the East End of London. It's one of the poorest areas in Europe, um, and it's been traditionally the place also which is the most cosmopolitan, because it's very poor, it's always welcomed immigrants. Um, most notably in the late 19th century, there was a very nasty anti-Semitic pogrom in Eastern Europe. And people came from Russia, <coughs> Germany, Austria, Poland, and they came to the East End of London. Um, and interestingly enough, they brought them their books, highly literate, highly educated exodus, who brought knowledge, uh, historical past, and in the building next door to the Whitechapel Gallery was the biggest collection of Yiddish publications in Europe in the early 1900s. That demographic has changed. Uh, in the 1940s and 50s, it's, it's, it uh, moved towards a South Asian demographic. Um, and one of our problems is that as people prosper, they leave. So their prosperity isn't really ploughed back into the area. However, because it's a very poor part of the city, it's also where artists naturally gravitate. There are 10,000 artists who live in a square mile around Whitechapel and 120 galleries. So it's a very interesting place to work. Very cosmopolitan, very diverse, very dynamic. Now, the, um, the, the, the challenge in this situation was to, um, in, the early 19, in the late 19th century, the, uh, there was a kind of Victorian impulse to improve the world, to act as a kind of missionary into the darkest reaches of what were known then as the drunken classes. Um, and uh, there's a historian called Seth Govan who said that the mission of, of Canon Barnett and his wife Henrietta Barnett was to use the display of art objects and to create a working class public in order to promote social reclamation and urban renewal. Well, that continues in a way to this day. If you think about how the agendas around museums are very much locked into urban regeneration. The gallery and exhibitions were conceived in instrumentalist terms to provide moral guidance and redemption for a largely illiterate public. Furthermore, the public space, with no admission charges, founded in the wake of the public library movement, was seen as the critical tool in neutralising class conflict and delivering social cohesion. Um, so there was a very clear political agenda. One of the um, uh, great aspects of the Whitechapel was that the um, director never patronised his audience. He was always concerned to bring them the very best. Um, here is a facade drawing of the Whitechapel Gallery with the old library building that was co-founded with it and which we have acquired and which we're expanding into. This was the great library which has moved to a new building and uh, seven years ago my predecessor, Catherine Lampert, negotiated with the local council to, to buy the building. The week I started in 2001, I had signed a contract to spend a million pounds on buying it which was terrifying, and um, so I found everybody I knew and they said, are you mad, this is the greatest opportunity the White Chapel's ever had, buy it, so we did. Um, and so this is, uh, this is going to be a little bit of a case study for us. Um, at the beginning, in 1901, they had a great picture show, and like all, all museum displays at the time, it was based on this. 
This is a painting by David Tenius from uh, 1651, um, titled, well, you see the title there. And as you can see, it was the convention of stacking uh, paintings in a salon style, um, hang one above the other, um, arranged actually by size, not content. Um, and they would typically be against different, very deep colours. And you can still see it in many museums today. It was a convention that was repeated in the Louvre, in uh, the Royal Academy, and you can still see it in the presentation of historic works. And sure enough, uh, the Whitechapel Gallery followed in, in the wake of this. Um, and their very first show in 1901, which was 300 years of great British art, and they had Constable and Turner and Gainsborough, pre-Raphaelites, was displayed in this manner. Um, the American critic Brian O'Doherty, uh, who's the author of the very famous book on the white cube, describes this system of exhibition making as follows. Each picture was seen as a self-contained entity, totally isolated from its slum class neighbour, slum close neighbour, by heavy frames around and a complete perspectival system within. Space was discontinuous and categorizable, just as the houses in which these paintings hung had rooms for different functions. The 19th century mind was taxonomic, and the 19th century eye recognized hierarchy of, hierarchies of genre and the authority of the frame. So this was a very, very widespread convention. And what I want to demonstrate is how it's been used, abused, and actually reinvented. Um, the, this kind of uh, use of framing and hanging in the East End was also resonant of great country houses. So it was kind of an, an interesting offer to the very poorest of people. And it reminds me of the Moscow Underground, designed as a palace, that you would have this very, very grand space for the poorest illiterate people, free of charge. They could come in and believe for a moment that they were in a great aristocratic house. When, um, however, this has been you know, also criticised because it was seen as a sort of form of escapism. The same historian Seth Coven comments, the catalogue description of the exhibitions as a whole strove to create the illusion that workers were actively promoting their self-betterment by viewing art, when in fact they were being diverted from directly challenging the basis of power in society. So here we see the idea of the salon as a kind of distraction or escapism through the painting and the wind and the frame of the painting as a window into another world. This was to be directly challenged and used in an, in an ironic way by, of course, the um, uh, Russian constructivists. And here, the last futurist exhibition of paintings by Malevich, you can see it's, a, it's almost like a pastiche of a salon hand, but of course it's all abstract. And most importantly, in the corner where the icon in a Russian house would normally be situated is the, the famous paradigmatic black square. So we can see how he takes that convention and then uh, kind of turns it upside down. It was in 1929 that MoMA delivered the final death knell to the Salon Hang. Um, and uh, Margaret Scolari Barr, who was the partner of a uh, wife of um, Albert Barr, Alfred Barr, sorry, wrote about this retrospectively, when he decided to no longer stack pictures on top of each other in this brand new museum. She says, there were no pictures above other pictures, all the walls were neutral, and the pictures were hung intellectually, chronologically. Previously, the walls would be either panelling or else they would be brocade, red brocade, blue brocade, green brocade, which would suck the colour out of the pictures. Instead, the idea was to let the pictures stand on their own feet. So here we see the, the evolution of a new convention of white walls, of single paintings, all separated from each other, and really hung in relation to the viewer's body. So it's a paradigm shift, and it revolutionized the way that we hang works of art in museums and in temporary exhibitions. However, in 1981, the British artists Gilbert and George decided to go back to the Salon Hang. And here we have this wonderful installation from the Whitechapel where they use the conventions of the Salon Hang and also, I would say, the church. 
Um, certainly the um, uh, critic and historian and curator Marco Livingstone has talked about the colours in Gilbert and George as being, of course, akin to stained glass. Um, but what's interesting here is that they take these two conventions, the salon hang and the church, but what they show is their object of desire, which was white working class men, young men. So here we have something that was still taboo in 1980s London, um, which was this very dramatic um, display of a homoerotic um, celebration, but within these conventions of the salon and the church. 2001, Nan Golden does the similar thing. Uh, she plays with this salon and church motif in a big retrospective called Devil's Playground. Uh, again, rejecting chronology, she edited clusters of work into narrative sequences. She used deep purple, emerald, crimson, and black, and stacked and juxtaposed images to evoke the bells and smells of Catholic, medieval, and Baroque churches. Friends, lovers, and babies were transformed into Madonnas, Pietas, and Puti, death masks, and memento mori. Both projects jettison the neutrality of the white cube to reiterate the atmosphere of a white chapel. Yet the return of the repressed did not inaugurate a new morality, rather the space was occupied by images of the profane. Part two, gallery as theatre. The concept of the, the um, theatrum mundi, the, the theatre of the world, which comes through drama, philosophy, um, I think can also be um, attached to our ideas about museum and exhibition spaces, where the gallery becomes a kind of stage set, where other worlds are mirrored, where dramas are enacted, where there are clues, scenarios, um, and also the, the spectator themselves becomes a player, becomes an, an, they animate the scene. This is an exhibition from the White Chapel in 1902, based on a picture of Japan, um, it offered a vast display of art and life in Japan and included carvings, bronzes, lacquer furniture, books, musical instruments, and colored prints. It reconstructed a Japanese room, a model of a tea house, and a full-blown temple, providing a living geography lesson, which was in the uh, catalog. It sought to present an exotic and utterly westernized notion of an oriental culture. Now the origins of this kind of world, of this kind of exhibition making, of course, was in the world fairs, um, where Europe really demonstrated its, its colonies, its empires, um, and also it paraded its idea about nationalism. Very important at the turn of the 19th century, this idea of establishing nationhood, and also of imaging the nations of others around the world. And so this kind of creation was a way of um, establishing different identities, establishing a kind of rhetoric of power, um, and then continued in world fairs really up until the Second World War um, with the um, things like the Mies Pavilion and the standoff between the Russian and German pavilions, the Albert Speer versus the Constructivist Pavilion in 1933. So this is the kind of origin of it, but it's also interesting, I think, in terms of creating this exotic space within the gallery, that it is theatrical, um, and it will lead, as we will see, to a kind of um, critique of the ultimate theatricality of the theme park. Um, this idea of a, of a theatrical space of play um, is, again, here this wonderful work by Marcel Duchamp called The First Papers of Surrealism. This was an exhibition held in 1942 in the ballroom of the White Law Reed Mansion in New York. Um, and Marcel Duchamp worked with two sisters to weave a web of 16 miles of thread throughout the otherwise traditionally displayed modern paintings selected by André Bresson and representing uh, a whole influx of European emigres. First papers referred to the displaced status of the artists and the papers they needed to get to enter America in the 1940s. Um, this great uh, retrospective exhibition uh, was tied up with string for the Vernissage um, and basically, Duchamp, he renamed it, um, he made it to a kind of gigantic web called the Mile of String. And then